So today we have uh, Keith as the seminar presenter, and then uh, he's he's working under the supervision of Dr. Javier Escuduro, and he's uh, starting his third year at PhD now, and then he wants to share his uh, research with us. And then I'll over to Keith. Hi, <laughs> uh, yes, so I'm uh, working in IDCOM um, in association with the uh, Alzheimer's Scotland Dementia Research Centre. So my PhD is about um, trying to develop novel network science techniques um, to analyze the EEG, functional connectivity from EEG. So basically this talk will be about a paper which has just recently been accepted to the Journal of Neuroscience Methods. So basically I'll be explaining the methodology that we present in this paper and the results and the conclusions. So we'll go straight to the basics. So for those who don't know, a network is basically is an object which has vertices, <coughs> these are blue circles, and uh, the <coughs> lines here, these are the edges connecting the vertices. So we can analyze the topology of this kind of uh, object, and particularly we want to know that the degree, so the degree is the number of edges adjacent to the node. So for this one here, this vertex here, it has a degree of three, because it has three edges connecting it. So uh, networks, there uh, is a way, it's a framework that we can use to to understand the functional connectivity of the EEG because the EEG has uh, many channels um, over the scalp, and these channels pick up uh, different signals. So we want to understand the dependency of these signals, and uh, basically, it finds a clinical use in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and uh, disorders such as schizophrenia where the activity of the brain changes but there's not many physically outward symptoms of the disease. So this is where this uh, type of uh, topology, this type of framework can help us. And so generally we want to form a, a weighted adjacency matrix. So each pair of channels, uh, we define some dependency between the channels. So it could be correlation, it could be something more to do with the phase of the signal, the signals. And that, uh, that measure then becomes the ith column jth entry of the matrix. So one of the main things that people find when they look at brain networks, so when you look at this topology, they find that uh, there's a lot, it's, it's very complex. <laughs> and they find that there are certain aspects, like there's a high modularity, the, the brain decomposes into different modules of, of, of activity and also there's a hierarchical organization. There are certain nodes which appear to be more important than others in the, in the, in the network. And uh, when we look at the, the high degree nodes, we actually notice that the, these, these high degree nodes, they, they tend to kind of cluster together, so they actually have high connections uh, between each other, and this forms what they call a rich club of activity. And but basically what we're seeking to explain here is what role does the hierarchical structure play in the complexity of these brain networks. And we go on to develop a model and a metric to analyze this. So when we were talking about the topology, a graph topology, particularly what's, what it's useful for is looking at the interdependence between different th these different vertices, how they're interacting with each other. So one of the ideas that which has come forth is this idea that a uh, node is, is not just important if it's very highly connected, but it also depends on which nodes it's connected to. So if it's connected to important <coughs> nodes, it is itself seems to be important. So in this respect, we can see that uh, this node here is connected to one of degree nine, whereas this node here is connected to one of degree four. Even though they have the same degree, we would say that this one is more important than this one because it's connected to the more important node. So how do we look at this in, in a general way? And especially when we're talking about the hierarchy. So we can say that if these nodes have the same degree, they, they're in a similar hierarchical level of the system. And then we can basically study, okay, so how are these, what are the connections that the nodes of the same degree, uh, how, how are they similar or how are they different? Or what's the, the complexity of these interactions, basically? So what we do is we, we compute what we call the neighborhood degree sequences. So we take the degrees of the nodes connected to a given node. 
So if we have a degree of, say, 5, then we can look at the, these sequences will have a length 5, because they're all connected to 5 nodes. And then we look at the degrees of those nodes, which is connected to. So basically then what we do is we compute something which is very simple, which is the complexity and what, uh, the variance of those sequences over overall uh, k length, length of k. So basically what we're doing here is we want to see, okay, how similar, what is the, do these nodes of the same degree, do they have a similar, similar role in a network? Are they connected to the same kind of nodes, basically? So, for example, we'll give you an example. This is quite a simple one. So we have this very ordered looking structure. We have one uh, node which has a high degree and then there's like decreases. These nodes have a low degree. And if we look at the degree sequences, we see that the level two nodes are connected to two level four nodes. And this comes up here. For the, the nodes of degree three, it's four, four, six. And actually what we find is that for all the, these degrees, they all have the same degree sequences within the, the given degree. So obviously the complexity is zero. Now if we look at the something which is more like a brain structure, <laughs> we have uh, something which is a bit more complicated, as you can see. And likewise, what we get is quite a high degree for the complexity. And so we would say that this graph is, the hierarchical complexity of this graph is, is high. Is up much higher. Now that's the metrics, so now the model, basically what we want to do is how do we create a hierarchical structure from, uh, which, is, which is complex. So we propose to do this by, we start off with a random adjacency matrix. So the, the matrix is symmetric and has zero diagonal because we're looking at the, the pairwise uh, dependency between channels i and j for each i and j. Now, so we just take random entries, we just create a random, a random one of these with random weights between zero and one. And then what we do is we, we bin these vertices into Q hierarchical levels. So we choose, maybe we want three levels, and we want, and uh, how do we, give these an appropriate distribution, so we choose a geometric distribution, which is a discrete distribution with a, you can see it's got a, a large tail. So in this example, uh, we, we, the default we choose is, uh, for this, for the parameter is PG equals 0 0.6, which gives us a distribution like this here. And then uh, once we've been these hierarchical levels, once we know which nodes are in which level, we then begin to separate these levels by the weights. So we just create a very simple parameter. We just add an additional weight. So we add the same weight to each, uh, to each edge adjacent to the node. And the weight is determined by the hierarchy level. So that's where the Q minus one comes from. So when we do this, what we get is an adjacency matrix which looks something like this. So you see there's a randomness in this adjacency matrix, but also there are clearly there, we've got this, these nodes which have a higher weight indicated by the yellow. And also we understand that actually this creates this uh, rich club topology that we talked about earlier. Because if two nodes are in the same hierarchical level, they actually get a, a double, double the, added, the, the additional weight for that hierarchical level. So if it's a high level, it gets a very high additional weight. And so th those two nodes will be have a, generally have a good connection. Now, in order to analyze this thoroughly, how do we analyze it? So basically, what, we, what we're going to, in the paper, we, we provide this in detail, but we'll try and go through this a bit quicker. So there's basically, in the, a lot of networks in, the, in most fields, they deal with like sparse binary cases. So we've got these very few connections, and we've got these for the, for the given number of nodes. So these are kind of very, uh, general, like very well used types of graphs. And we want to find a complete weighted version of these. We want to bring this from the sparse binary form so that we can use this to compare it with our complete weighted matrices. So we do this, we generalize, we have a method to generalize this basically. <coughs> and uh, we won't go through the details, but uh, basically we can, we can do this. And if you look at actually all of these graphs, the, the hierarchical complexity of all these graphs is zero. And you can see actually they're all very ordered graphs, so that's not particularly surprising. 
So the next thing we have to do is we select some comparisons for the metrics. And we, we look at, particularly, we look at like what are the main things which people use in the field, what are the main metrics they use, and what do these metrics describe. So the first one we use is integration. This is very common, uh, commonly used uh, topological feature. So we want to know how integrated this, this uh, graph is. You know, are the nodes uh, communicating in small cliques, or are they communicating in general over, a, in, over, over the whole network? very efficiently. And we can choose the clustering coefficient to do this. So for the star network, we have a, a low clustering. <coughs> for the fractal modular network, we have a very high clustering coefficient. Because if you look here, you've got uh, a lot of uh, clustering within this small section. A lot here, a lot here, a lot here. So for a small number of edges, this is basically how we can create a very high clustering. Um, the next one, we look at the irregularities, and this is related to what they call scale-free. So scale-free basically is this property where if, if you look at uh, a lot of real networks, they, they tend to have very high uh, degree nodes, much higher than you would expect by random chance. So this is uh, shown in the degree distribution. If you look at the degree distribution, these will have a very long tail, a very heavy tail. And so basically, you'll have a lot of very low degree nodes and then a very long tail of the distribution where you still have a couple of like very high degree nodes. So that's called the scale-free characteristic. And we show in the paper that basically we can largely measure this by looking at the variance of the degrees, basically. And uh, in our examples, the regular lattice has uh, all the degrees are the same, so the degree variance is zero. For this one, we have uh, one very high degree node and the rest are just one. So the variance is very high. And actually, if you have a very small number of edges, this is, this is basically how you get a high degree variance. <coughs> Modularity is another commonly used uh, idea in brain networks. And there's a script, we have a metric, we just take the metric to, that they use in the other papers, we use that one. For here, the star network has a modularity of zero. And the modular network, which we defined, has a high modularity as we would expect. So when we're talking about the sparse binary networks, how do we analyze a complete weighted network? The, the, the binary network is still a very useful framework to study. And most people study these. So we look to a way of where we can threshold this weighted network over percentage density ranges, basically. So we have, we ended up with 100 networks, which are thresholded de percentage uh, densities for these networks. And this creates a kind of curve, I'll show you what I mean. So if we look at this, we have, uh, let me go back. We have uh, uh, just chosen this generic uh, matrix here with symmetric weights. We have a proportion then we, we, we choose a threshold, so okay, we take P equal to 0 0.2. For this we have 15 edges, and the, so P is, provides us with three edges. And then we choose the highest weights, so it thresholds at the highest weights. We can uh, then increase the threshold, keep increasing the threshold, we get a denser and denser network, and eventually we get the complete network. And if we analyze each of these with the topological metrics, we'll end up with a, a curve over the density, which we'll show. So, so how do we, what do we use? We use a, we look at a resting state EEG, 64 EEG uh, data set, eyes open. There's 109 participants and uh, we're looking at the beta frequency range just between about, uh, there it says 12 to 32 hertz. So this is a very commonly used uh, frequency range for brain networks basically. We want to compare two measures of connectivity. The first we use is uh, coherence and which is kind of a, basically a correlation at a specific frequency. So we want to, so coherence is seen to be that it may still be biased by amplitude. So we look at something which is m more independent of amplitude as well, which we look at the, what's called the weighted phase lag index. So it looks at the imaginary part of the cross spectral density to try and minimize the, the influence of amplitude, which is seen to be uh, biased by volume conduction where two electrodes which are close together are picking up the same activity. So we're trying to 
eliminate that, eliminate that with this uh, measure. So we'll look at some results. So here's the segregation, C. Here's irregularity, modularity, hierarchical complexity. That's our, our measure, what we're measuring. We, the blue line is the coherence, and the red is the phase. And then these ones are the, the archetypes which we, which we showed. But I'll exp I won't explain too much about that. But some important things to notice here, for example, is um, here the coherence networks are very have a very high uh, segregation. Actually, there's a segregation, and the uh, WPLI is much more integrated. In fact, the coherence is very close to the grid lattice and the regular lattices, and we can basically see that these these lattices are, in some way, they're computing the closeness of the vertices. So vertices which are close are more likely to be connected. So the closer the so what we can basically say here is yes, the the coherence seems to be more affected by what this volume conduction effect. So this actually shows this. It's more likely that the what it's picking up on is this idea that nodes which are close together are uh, connected together. And if we look at, okay, we go straight to hierarchical complexity. So what we see basically is that, yes, our, the, the brain networks are very com complex. And the complexity, the hierarchical complexity particularly is very strong. And uh, here's the random network you can see here. So this is just random weights. So a lot, even the random network has a very low hierarchical complexity. And the EEG is doing very very high. So this is the phase lag index. Again, the phase, the more phase dependent connectivity measure shows a more complex uh, topology. If you look at the model, again, we've got this the same structure of metrics here. Now, we compare with some very commonly used uh, models. I won't go into the details, but basically what we see here is this. This one is a small world model. It's not very useful for brain networks. You can see the behavior is quite is very different to what we had before for the brain networks. The the other one seems very inflexible. It's very difficult to to know what density range you're analyzing when you put in the parameters. But uh, our model that shows the gray lines and this what the increasingly light line lines here are basically we increase the strength parameter. The more we increase the strength parameter, the, the more separated the hierarchy levels become. And if, if the strength parameter is equal to 1, in fact, they are completely or nearly separable. So the hierarchy level of 1 is, is basically all the connections have a, a different range than, than the ones below it. Now, if we look at the hierarchical complexity, when we increase this strength parameter, we begin to increase the hierarchical complexity up to a certain point. And then after that certain point, it begins to decrease again. And so this is very interesting because it's showing us that if we go from a random network up to a very hierarchically, a very well-defined hierarchical structure, the complexity increases and then decreases again. So the complexity is arising between uh, random structure and uh, well-defined hierarchical structure where the nodes are basically segregated into different classes completely. Now uh, if we compare the, the model with the EEG, so we look at the, the phase and we compare it with the, the model and what we see actually is a very similar structure appearing. The, the, the curves are behaving quite similarly, you can see. You can see there's a difference here, the modularity. Um, there's is quite a clear difference throughout the whole curve, which we can talk about later. Uh, in fact, we, we want to see <coughs> what, so this is the most comparable, but is, a, is there one which is uh, more complex? Is there a model that we have which is more complex than the EEG? And basically we can answer that saying there isn't. So the EEG is actually more hierarchically complex than the model which we designed specifically to 
target type hierarchical complexity, which is a very interesting result. So we can see here, uh, basically this shows us the, we do a statistical test uh, from a Wilcoxon ranks, some test of populations of the model and, popul and the EEG population, the networks, for the hierarchical complexity. And we see that uh, basically the one which is most complex, this, this yellow one here, is only which is as good as the EEG and is never better than it. There is a, a little anomaly here which is explained by, if we go back, you can begin to see here that there's a separation where actually the model is more complex than the EEG. So the conclusions of this talk basically, the the model is, we have a very quite flexible model and it seems to behave quite similarly to the EEG. And the question that can arise is, can we make this more similar? And the answer is yes. We have a, a abstract that, which we'll present uh, later this month in the Complex Networks Conference, which is in Milan this year, where we create a, we create a, another parameter for increasing the modularity in the network, basically. We can do that quite simply, actually. We show that the WPLI networks exhibit the highest complexity of what we've seen. So then another question is, well, what about other networks? What about social networks or the internet or these kind of networks? We don't know, and it would be nice to maybe find that out. The, we show that the coherence is, is less complex than the phase dependency, and we, we basically extrapolate that this is because of the volume conduction effect. And the evidence seems to be suggesting that random networks are not topologically random, which is something which I didn't, we can look back at this. So here we have the random network, which is in black. And basically what we're seeing here is a very restricted topology. So especially when you compare it with the variance of the model or with the the EEG, the variance of the of the values which you can get from a random network is very, very small. It suggests that actually the topology of these random networks is very, very similar. So it's not really, some people say that the random network is a kind of uh, average network or something, but I would argue from this that it's definitely not an average network. And it's certainly not helpful in uh, relating to uh, real world networks like EEG, which is quite a commonly uh, Basically, that, that is a quite a commonly proposed um, opinion. Yeah. So again, what we want to see is can we actually prove this thing about random networks, which I'm working on a little bit. And if we can prove it, what, is, what does a topologically random network look like? That's another interesting question. So the, this is the graphical abstract for the paper, and basically, what we show is that the hierarchical complexity arises between uh, more all nodes are equal systems, like random networks or regular networks, and uh, systems which are strict, strictly class-based, where the, the nodes can be segregated into specific classes, basically. Thank you very much. So that's the end of the talk. Um, this is nice with this year. Um, Please. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we just hear from a different background. I would like to understand. So how many EEG points do you have on the head of a patient? And, and how many measurements do we do? The so it depends basically the, there's there's various setups. You can get as little as say eight or you can get as many as 128, even 256 possibly, which is very crowded. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, something we, we look into as well when, the, when we're looking at the Alzheimer's disease and this kind of thing. How, how can we make a more compact design for the EEG? And the uh, sampling rate we is around anything from 200 to 1,000 hertz, thousands of hertz. Yeah. And, and, and the second question is this, is that, so these, these kind of research, what, what kind of application do you think uh, as an outcome uh, 
it is is for diagnosing the these kind of diseases like uh, Alzheimer or or schizophrenia as you mentioned in the, in the first page. Yeah, so that's uh, something which we we would like to look into, and basically it would be nice to get some nice result which showed that the Alzheimer's disease networks are less hierarchically complex than normal networks or something like that. Obviously that's probably what we might hypothesize because Alzheimer's disease basically begins to disconnect the network. It begins to kind of destroy the, the organization of the brain. And so we would expect probably that uh, there will be a, a more kind of a random structure appearing in the networks which is proposed by s some people. And if that is the case then we would hope to find that the hierarchical complexity of Alzheimer's disease patients is lower, and uh, that's something which we'll look into next year, and hopefully we can get something that will It may not be the case. Um, so uh, I would like to just first co confirm my understanding of uh, your presentation. So uh, you're uh, proposing a measure of complexity for graphs. So when you say EEG network, it's uh, the network implied by the data uh, by using that coherency as a metric. Yeah, uh, correct. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, is the and um, uh, what's the background of this topic? I mean, uh, I, I presume there are <coughs> ways to basically measure graph complexity, and is this uh, use? I mean, is this the complex hierarchical? Uh, ordering of vertices uh, is it unique is it or is it a hierarchical topology uh, I mean is it is it one, one of all possible orderings of uh, uh, vertices and the, and the metric based on that ordering or can you come up with other orderings um, yeah well, I mean, what, what, yeah, what's the yeah. background of, of the work I think? so I think the main system? The main insight which we have for this is that the the, 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 no, the neighborhood degree sequences are useful for looking at the complexity, specifically for the hierarchical complexity. And yeah, so what's what, the what do you mean by hierarchical complexity? A given a graph, it's undirected, so it doesn't imply any hierarchy unless you start ordering the nodes. So we define in this you know, edges and yeah. thing, et in this paper we define the hierarchy as the based on the degrees. Mm -hmm. So high degree nodes are at the highest hierarchical level. Mm -hmm. Lowest degree nodes are at the lowest hierarchical level. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is basically high degree nodes are very important in the graph. They're allowing uh, a kind of flow of information from all edges to all others in a very efficient manner. So this is where this idea of uh, the high degree nodes being uh, more important in the structure of the brain or in, in structure of other networks comes in. So yeah, we're not looking at the, we, we're defining this hierarchy as based on the, the degrees, yeah, degrees in the graph. Okay. So that's a definition we have, maybe we've assumed that we may know that yeah, okay. it's basically what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask one or two questions about, so you've shown us these kind of matrices which show the connectivity or whatever, but I guess what I'm failing to grasp at the moment is, so when you, when you do the EEG and you have 64 sensors, are, they, are you doing a measurement from every sensor, from every sensor to every other sensor? Yeah, so... <coughs> yeah, this may be a, a good way. So basically we can think of this as, okay, let's say we have a, a EEG with six sensors. So the, the I the ith uh, row in the jth column is some dependency measure computed between the channels i and channel j. Yeah. Right, so, so, so what does that mean physically? So when you, you know, so obviously you do the EEG and you measure across these frequencies, so you're then doing like a cross correlation or to just understand you know, yeah. how you physically feel, you know, how you get from the physical EEG process to the connectivity numbers. Yeah. So and that's probably just my, my kind of stupidity level. <laughs> oh no, it's good. Rather than explain it properly. <laughs> that's a good question. No, I probably didn't go through it in enough detail. So here basically is some measures which, which are used to compute uh, a value between any two channels. Mm -hmm. 
So there's the coherence, which is, this is based on the cross-spectral density. So it's basically, in an intuitive sense, it's a, it's a measure of correlation based on a specific sure. frequency sure, yeah, uh, between the two channels. So we can mm -hmm. average this over, frequency band, over the frequency band. So what we get is one measure for every pair of channels. And then we insert that directly into this matrix. Right, sure. And uh, this is the matrix which encodes the graph, the information of the graph. Yeah, yeah. How sensitive is that? Because presumably your EEG will be more s might be more sensitive at certain frequencies than other frequencies, if that makes sense. So, um, so you, you've written on the slide there 12 to 32 hertz, so is that considered to be the kind of key frequency range? Because if I measure at some frequency where perhaps I'm not getting enough response, I might kind of pull up or pull down the overall coherence. Yeah, that's an, well. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I, we haven't really looked at that at all. But that's, but basically, the, there are certain bands which are shown as uh, important for certain tasks or certain functions of the brain. So it's split into about five: is delta, alpha, beta, gamma. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so basically, in theta as well. So alpha is like between about eight and twelve hertz, and that is very important for things like, um, I think for uh, uh, cognition, things like this. So being alert. Right. So if you've got eyes closed and eyes open, then there's a difference in the alpha. Um, and beta is another range which they've, which they've defined as, as being important for things like uh, attention to tasks and things like this. So we just, I mean, delta, when it gets lower frequencies, it becomes more subconscious levels and things like this. Right, so sure. we, we look, we try and focus more on something which is relevant to what we will eventually be doing, which is looking at um, cognitive tasks uh, applied to Alzheimer's disease. Mm. So you anticipate those frequencies, you might see a bigger, you know, bigger effect if the brain is starting to get disconnected. Yeah. In fact, we can expect different topologies, slightly different topologies, depending on the frequency range we sure. chose. And uh, in the supplementary material of this uh, uh, journal paper, we, we provide that information. Is he going to go for one last question? Can you show this? I think we've had the same question as John, but as a sanity check, uh, what if you measured like coherence uh, basically between spatial positions of the nodes? So you've measured coherence and you know, measure connectivity based on signals, but uh, for us to really believe the results, we would have to compare against some some bonkers baseline, which might just be the distance between the nodes, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, some nodes, I guess, the brain density or the school density changes. So, how do we know that these results have anything to do with EEG signals as opposed to the physical spatial positions of the nodes? So, you know, the node in the middle mm -hmm. uh, and on the top of the school might have connectivity, much better connectivity with a lot of neighboring nodes mm -hmm. just because it's on a flatter surface. Yeah. All, all, all those kind of things. Can you can you test for those? Or, or maybe a more general question is: Should you be testing <laughs> against that as a as a benchline, as a benchmark? Yeah, I think uh, in most EEG datasets they give you the the positions on the scalp, which kind of general because obviously for each scalp it's slightly different. But they they have a ten twenty system, which is basically percentages of the the length and breadth of the scalp which people place the electrodes at, and. This is kind of what we're looking at here, actually, is this idea, because what people propose, and I, I'm not, sh I'm not sure how much research has been done into like comparing with distances for the volume conduction effect, but the volume conduction effect is well documented, and it's known that yeah, if you use things which are dependent on amplitude, like say you take just straightforward correlation, you can expect yeah, the closer nodes are going to have this kind of redundant connectivity because actually it's picking up the same activity. And uh, what people propose is that these more phase-based measures, like the, the phase lag index, this looks at the imaginary part of the, of the Fourier spectrum rather than the, the real part. And that's trying to minimize this, this, idea, this idea of the, the uh, and look at more strictly at the phase and, and less on the amplitude. And yeah, basically, we kind of show here that if we do that, then we do get a network which is, seems to be less dependent on the what would be expected from a kind of uh, the closer something is, the more connected, the more the higher the connectivity, which would be 
uh, which would show probably some redundancy in what we're doing. And so the phase based measure does appear to overcome that to some extent, um, which we can see from here. This is drastically decreased from here. And yeah, I didn't go into that in too much detail, but basically these two, the yellow line and the blue line, these are ring lattice and grid lattices. And in, the, in what we do, this is basically encoding how these are types of network where basically the closer they are, the, the, more like, the, more, the higher the connectivity is. So what we actually do see is in the coherence that it seems to be quite up with this. And so maybe there is a large amount of redundancy there. That's, yeah. <coughs> Whereas the phase, it does appear to be significantly uh, decreased. So the information seems to be different. And it's certainly not random because we're not getting random uh, complexity. I was going to make a similar appeal to test something <laughs> over, or over uh, basically the information matrix of a Gaussian random field where you have a you select a distance based uh, correlation function and then in your matrix what's, what, what you have is uh, zero if, if two random variables are not connected and the canonical co uh, correlation coefficient if they are and um, then maybe Presumably, on a on a given random field model, it's going to be a full, fully connected network. Um, and based on that model, it might be possible to generate graphs and basically um, order them with respect to their complexity and see uh, how much away they are from the original model, mm. and uh, and maybe compare how the complexity. Uh, if, if there is any correspondence of the complexity with respect to the statistical distance of divergence mm. with respect to the original fully connected model. Um, that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much for coming. Let's uh, give a few round of applause. <laughs>